Well, I did change the title. Um, since titles aren't scripted, that's what we do, preachers and teachers. Um, the Lamb wins the final war. I want to read to you in your presence. Chapter 14 of Revelation, verses 6 through 13. I read those last week, but because uh, Ted waved his hand and said, it's, it's time to cut it off, you're preaching too long. You remember last week, I had to stop. So um, we'll finish it up uh, this week. Verses 6 through uh, verse 13. <laughs> Revelation 14, verse 6, Then I saw another angel flying directly overhead with an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on earth, to every nation and tribe and language and people. And he said with a loud voice, Fear God and give Him glory because the hour of His judgment has come and worship Him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. Another angel, a second, followed, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, she who made all nations drink the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality. And another angel, a third, followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and its image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, he also will drink the wine of God's wrath, pour full strength into the cup of his anger, and he will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. They have no rest, day or night, these worshipers of the beast in its image, and whoever receives the mark of its name. Here's a call for the endurance of the saints, those who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, write this, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Blessed indeed, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, for their deeds follow them. <coughs> That's that sort of <coughs> Heavenly Father, these are words uh, straight from heaven, from your heart, that reveal, that unveil your view of things on earth. Apart from your word, we would only see things the way we want to see them. Lord, the church needs to hear these words. And those who have ears to hear what the Spirit is saying with these words, Lord, you have promised back in chapter 1 for those who read and hear and obey and take in these words with heartfelt conviction, you promise blessing and reward. You entice us to obey by holding out in front of us unspeakable joy and mercy. And we pray these things in your name. <coughs> there is a common denominator, it's undeniable, among mankind, and that is the desire for justice. If you perk up your ears to listen for it, it's around you all the time. For example, like that guy pulled up in my driveway this past, yesterday, we start a conversation. He tells me where he lives, and I didn't even have to say anything. He just, property taxes. In his mind, I assure you, he thinks there's an injustice going on in the state of Illinois. <laughs> if, you, if you listen for it, a common denominator is happening around us all the time. It's instinct. It's innate. And that is a pursuit for justice. But justice is broken down in several ways. And the way this breaks down results in ultimately Jesus coming back and making war. We've read the word war several times already in the book of Revelation. If you go back and just do a word study, Google study, uh, how many times is the word war used in the book of Revelation? There is a real battle going on, and the battle is over in justice. But we need to pause and think about justice just for a moment. Perceived injustice. There's really nothing wrong there. It's just from your point of view, it looks wrong. 
Several years ago, about this time of the year, uh, I did a wedding for Joel Daniels, the Daniels family. It was held up in Wheaton, and uh, uh, I gave thanks. It was time for me to speak, and huge, lots and lots and lots of people there. And this was my opener. Don't think I'm going to open for Andrew and Alexander like this, but this was my opener for that wedding. Got finished praying. We all looked at our eyes. And I said it like this, something like this. You know that old slogan that came out of the late 60s during the Vietnam War? They were hang, hanging out posters. Make love, not war. And I saw people get on, you know, this is a wedding. And I paused and I waited. And I, then I said this. I've got a better idea. Get married and do both. (laughs) And after that laughing got done, then comes the hammer. And I quoted this text. James chapter 4, verse 1 and 2. What causes quarrels And what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? So you desire and you do not have. So you murder, you covet and cannot obtain. So you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. That was my opener at a wedding. And I thank the Lord how the Lord used this subject so that we could all understand when you get married, as I'm fond of saying, I just love it. It's a good picture in the mind. Marriage is like two monkeys in one room and there's only one banana. The fight is on. Because you want what the other has or whatever. And that's the issue of perceived Injustice. There really isn't an injustice going on. And in the book of Revelation and in our lives and no matter where you go on this planet, everyone's looking at things and talking about their view of what is right and wrong. That's the issue of justice. I perceive that this is right. I perceive that this is wrong. And not everyone has a clear view of what is right and wrong because most of the time the world can still be described as in the days of the judges, everyone is still doing what is in their own and therefore I'm just I'm okay you're not perceived injustice is a common denominator among men because everyone is deciding what is right and what is wrong in their own eyes real injustice however would sound like this Jesus warned that since the world hated him, you and I are going to be hated. Here in the book of Revelation, we've seen many times already martyrdom. They're being slain. It's wrong to do that. That's an injustice. It's wrong to murder. This is real injustice. We would read from Paul's letter to the Corinthians in his first letter on the subject of suing a brother in Christ. He said, would you not rather be defrauded than to take your brother to court and sue him? Can you not, are you not judges among yourselves? Can you not settle this out of court? Why would you submit yourself to an ungodly judge and have him arbitrate over something within the body of Christ that where it ought to be dealt with? And even then, and Paul goes further, and even then, if it can't be settled in the church, wouldn't you rather just be defrauded like Christ was? Real injustice and just take it. So much so if they ask for your coat, give him another one. Or a mile, give him another one. Or a cheek, give him another one. Real injustice. And therefore we are to love our enemy and do not let evil overcome, but overcome evil with good. And then there is the subject of not just perceived injustice and real injustice, but real justice. Real justice. Let me ask you something. 
Do you think that real justice taking place in any court, in any land, under any nation, under any banner, in any language, do you think that pure, unmitigated, undiluted justice is taking place anywhere in the world? Pure, unmitigated, pure justice. No, there's not. That's why the Bible describes Jesus coming back at the end of the book of Revelation. He will say, I am coming soon, and I am coming with my recompense. Whew. It's called Judgment Day because no one, no one is arbitrating in any sense of the imagination with pure justice, with attitude with foresight, with the belief system. Everything that Jesus does is just and true. Just and true are all your ways. Revelation chapter 15, the song of Moses and the Lamb. It, is, it can only be said of the true judge of the earth that he does everything with pure justice. We only get close to it in this land. We get close to it. But no one mets out justice without a little bit of pride. No one mets out justice with a, lot, a little bit of vengeance of what the, heart is take, what the heart is doing. So this desire for justice is in part the reason there is war and will be wars and rumors of wars until the end. According to the book of James, verses 4, 1 and 2, chapter 4, 1 and 2, and what the Bible teaches, at the beginning of every war is someone not getting what they want, whether it's right or wrong. I used to read a lot uh, days gone by on just war theories under Augustine and those who have written about this over the years, and uh, when to put a stop to evil. When do you do that? What's a just war to combatants and not harming non-combatants? I think when Jesus comes, he's not going to make a single mistake on who is a combatant and a non-combatant. No friendly fire. He knows exactly what to do. That's how the book of Revelation opened up, because his eyes are blazing fire, and there is nothing hidden from his sight. Nothing. It's an incredible day that's coming in the future. Coming. Coming. And it all started in the Garden of Eden, God and Satan, and Jesus is going to return and he's going to put a stop to all the evil that has taken place. Your intrinsic desire for justice in this life is either bad news or good news for you, depending on what you do with Jesus. If you reject Jesus as the judge who wins the final war and your intrinsic desire for justice will be a witness against you in the lake of fire, Therefore, turn to Christ as one who is judged for you in your place, for you on the cross. And if that's the case, then your intrinsic desire for justice in this life will be totally swept up and satisfied in the return of Christ. That's the hope that these seven churches have because they're being harmed. There is perceived injustice going around. Well, no, that really wasn't unjust. Okay, you got what you deserved. But then there is real injustice all over the place, and there's only so far that we can go in this land in getting real justice. And finally, there's a really good truth for the church to hold on to. The son is coming back, and he will win this final war. He will bring his judgment and his recompense with me. Let me show you a little bit deeper where we left off last week, raising questions. Question number one, is the eternal gospel mentioned here in verse 6? Is the eternal gospel redemptive or punitive? The verse says, I saw another angel flying directly overhead with an eternal gospel. Well, okay, eternal gospel means it's, it's never diluted, it's never changed, it's consistent, it's constant, it's non-negotiable. It's an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on earth, and we've noticed throughout the book of Revelation, that phrase dwell on earth, or the earth dwellers are the combatants. They're at war with the Lamb. And we've already seen twice in chapter 13, they are making war on the saints. It says it twice. To those who dwell on earth, to every nation and tribe and language and people. 
And he said with a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come. Okay, it's Christ is returning. He, they are crying out. They would rather that rocks fall on them. We've read that. Hide us from the face of the Lamb. He's there and there's no more time for repentance. That's it. But the eternal gospel says, Fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. I take this passage right here identically parallel with Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 through 11. There's coming a day when Jesus returns that every knee will bow and every, knee will, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. And that's bad news for a lot of people. So in other words, the point is this. I do not believe that this is redemptive preaching here. It is punitive in nature. The gospel never changes. Repent. But that doesn't mean that there's time left. Time is up. You're going to hear the same truth that you've always heard Always heard, always heard, and now there is no more time to hear it. But you're going to hear it again anyway. So these commands, fear, give him glory, worship, I believe are, are compulsory edicts. It's called compulsory edicts. You will bow and you will confess. You had time to do it with a joyful heart, and now you're going to do it with a strap on your back. And that's the nature of this. These earth dwellers with their hostility toward Jesus Christ, they will be compelled to acknowledge the reality of who God is in Jesus. Which raises the next question, who is Babylon the Great then in verse 8? Another angel, a second following, saying, fallen, fallen is Babylon the the great, she who made all people groups. We need to keep that in mind. Do not think about political geographical borders. Ethnos, think about people groups. People groups within people groups within people groups. All nations drink the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality. Turn with me. We need to quickly find out and understand who is this Babylon the great. And then those who worship her. Chapter 17, verse 1 and 2 is very helpful. When we get to the bowls, then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and said to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great prostitute who is seated on many waters with whom the kings of the earth have committed sexual immorality and with the wine of whose sexual immorality the dwellers on earth have become drunk. So there it is, but now as you know, we're going to start all over again with the bows, another picture. We start at the beginning of the tribulation period. It's not chronological. It's swirling back around. Let's get another picture of this. And come and I will show you. And this was happening in the days of these seven churches. Chapter 17, verse 18, the very last verse, is like an explanation for verses 1 and 2. And the woman that you saw is the great city that has dominion over the kings of the earth. Okay, so it's not a real physical woman. Just like the bride of Jesus is not one particular singular woman, likewise, this is not one singular particular woman. It is a conglomerate. It's representative of the whole. The whole of what? The whole earth-dwelling system that is hostile to Jesus Christ. Then look, if you look at chapter 18, verses 1 through 3, we get this. After this, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was made bright with his glory. And he called out with a mighty voice, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She, because it's really a woman in one sense, because the portrayal of the, she has been unfaithful, unfaithful, earth dwellers unfaithful to following the Lord. She has become a dwelling place for demons, a haunt for every unclean spirit, a haunt for every unclean bird. Sounds like Stephen King. A haunt for every unclean and detestable beast, for all nations have drunk the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality, and the kings of the earth have committed immorality with her, and the merchants of the earth have grown rich from the power of her luxurious living.
We'll say more when we get to these sections of Scripture. For now, Babylon the Great stands for the world's lust for the promise of prosperity and welfare, an intoxication that the majority of the world's inhabitants imbibe on. Ivan, what do you mean by that? Here's what I mean. I mean all those who live in expensive penthouses in New York City all the way to the hillbilly in West Virginia who has figured out how to scam the system and get a welfare check every month so that he can hunt and fish as much as he wants to. That's what I mean. You don't have to be a millionaire to be described as someone who is drinking down the world's sexual immorality, a heart that has been unfaithful to following the Lord all the way to the merchants of the earth have grown rich from the power of her, of her luxurious living. Both millionaires and those who are living on $17,000 a year in West Virginia are all greedy. Unless you know the Lord. There's nothing wrong with having a million. If you want to give me some of your money, I'd be more than take it off your hands. More than happy. That's not the issue. The issue is how Jesus sees what is going on in the heart. And that is, doesn't matter whether you're a millionaire, a billionaire, or whether you're making 17 grand a year, scamming the welfare system in West Virginia. And I'm from West Virginia, I have a right to say this, and I've got family and friends that are listening to this, and I'm going to say it. You know who you are. And you've been doing it for decades living off the state and you have no desire to work and you're just as greedy as any millionaire in a penthouse in New York City because that's all you live for. There's no difference and that's how Jesus sees the heart. See, in the book of Revelation, all wicked world systems, including Rome in the days of these seven churches, are called by the symbolic name Babylon the Great. Babylon is the symbol of human civilization with all its pomp and circumstance organized in opposition to God. It refuses to bow down to the kingship and lordship of Jesus Christ over all of life. It is the sum total of pagan culture, social, intellectual, commercial, political, and religious. It is the very essence of evil, of heathenism. It is the symbol for collective rebellion against God in any and every form. It is the universal or world system of unbelief, idolatry, apostasy that opposes and persecutes the people of God and Jesus, the Lamb, takes it all personally. Takes it personally. And that's why, now let me put it in this in bold type, the one of earthly pleasure is temporary but the wine of God's wrath is eternal look again at verse 8 another angel a second followed saying fallen fallen is Babylon the great she who made all nations this, de this demonic triumvirate this unholy triumvirate is influencing and infecting the entire world system and the world system, the people's hearts, these earth dwellers, are literally like drinking from a wine bottle, drinking the passion of their own unfaithfulness. And the reason why sexual immorality is actually used here, the Greek word for pornea, which is used for all types of sexual deviations, is because in the heart, how Jesus sees the earth dwellers is an, a love affair. It's a love affair with what the world has to offer, which is why he used the term sexual immorality. It is both unfaithfulness in the heart, but at the same time, it is a, an affair that is going on in the hearts of men and women and boys and girls. You have been unfaithful in your heart in your affections, in your love. You are supposed to love the Lord your God with all your heart and love your enemy of yourself, as yourself. But no, you have loved the world, the flesh, and the devil. Babylon the Great. But that's temporary because in verse 10, he also will drink the wine of God's wrath poured full strength 
So the world thinks it's getting the very best when really it's only drinking Winking Owl from Aldi's. When it could have an $80 bottle from the best vineyard, Bordeaux Vineyard or Napa. But now the, the symbolism switches and what you thought was a great party, a great affair, you're going to drink something that is undiluted. You're, it's going to come full strength and you're going to drink it forever. Poured full strength into the cup of his anger and he will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment, the drinking down of this wine bottle goes up forever and ever and they have no rest day or night. These worshipers of the beast and its image and whoever receives what is characteristic of the very nature, the mark of his name, the very nature of his name Lying, deceiving, cheating, stealing, murdering. The intoxicating effect of drinking the world's wine is temporary. It's going to wear off, but the effect of drinking the wine of God's wrath is eternal. It will never wear off. Meaning, yes, hell is forever. It is not temporal. This wrath will never subside. It will never, ever wear out. That is to say, God's wrath, His justice, this final war where the Lamb is, and then it's going to crescendo by the time we get to chapter 18 and 19, when the Word comes out like a sharp sword and He will slay the nations and the final war is done. We've been getting small pictures of that, but the big picture is coming in chapter 19. And it is a war that is undiluted, it is full strength, it is unmitigated, it is unmixed with any mercy. Or long suffering. There is no one on planet earth this day, including you and including me, there is no one on planet earth that is receiving the unmitigated, undiluted wrath of God right now. No one's receiving it. Even the most violent, wicked, wicked, wicked is still getting mercy today because they will eat God's food, they will breathe God's air, they will drink God's water, and they will enjoy God's common grace and have friends and a bed to sleep in tonight. No one is receiving the undiluted, unmitigated wrath of God. But that day's coming. He wins the final war. Then two more questions. What is the nature of God's wrath? Chapter 18, verses 4 through 8 teaches this. Chapter 18 verses 4 through 8. What is the nature of God's wrath? Then I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her my people lest you take part in her sins, lest you share in her plagues for her sins are heaped high as heaven and God has remembered her iniquities. Pay her back as she herself has paid back others and repay her double for her deeds. Mix a double portion for her in the cup she mixed as she glorified herself and lived in luxury. So give her a like measure of torment and mourning since in her heart now here we get a clue so what's it like what is the nature of God's wrath because presently she says and I mean everyone who is in hostility toward Jesus Christ who are millionaires in penthouses all over the world or those who are scamming the system in the hills of West Virginia they all think of themselves as I sit as a queen I'm no widow I've got the world by the throat I'm not alone. I'm not grieving. I got it made in the shade. And mourning I will never see. For this reason her plagues will come in a single day, death and mourning and famine, and she will be burned up with fire. For mighty is the Lord God who has judged her. Chapter 18, verse 21. <laughs> verse 21 says this, Then a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea, saying, So will Babylon, the great city, be thrown down with violence and will be found no more. What's no more? What will be no more? The sound of harpists and musicians and flute players and trumpeters will be heard in you no more. Just think of it, what it was like. 
Now, I do not say this in a cavalier way. I'm telling you, no more will there be delightful music. Do you hear that? No more delightful music. And a craftsman of any craft will be found in you no more. No more the enjoyment of working with your hands and designing and figuring out and planning and adventure. And the sound of the meal will be heard in you no more. No more enjoyment of what it's like to work with your hands and bring in a good harvest. And the light of a lamp will shine in you no more. And the voice of bridegroom and bride will be heard in you no more. No more joy. That's what this is all about. For your merchants were the great ones of the earth. And all nations were deceived by your sorcery. And in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints. And of all who have been slain on earth. So let me answer it like this. What is the nature of God's wrath? My answer is this. It is not simply the physical dimension. It is both the spiritual and psychological anguish of the soul. No more joy. And the fire that burns forever, that we've read from, is the joyless, songless, it is the loneliness and the mourning of a widow sitting alone in her solitary torment. That is the meaning of the fire of God In the end, it is the painful realization that loving the things of this life did not bring me ultimate joy. And that will eat at you, you earth dwellers, forever and ever and ever. Which raises a very important question why then is God's wrath eternal? We've already read that chapter 14, verse 11 says that the smoke goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night. When we read chapter 19, verse 20, God's word says this, And the beast was captured, and with it the false prophet, who is in its who in its presence had done the signs by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped its image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur, and the rest were slain by the sword that came from the mouth of him who was sitting on the horse, that's the lamb, Jesus Christ, and all the birds were gorged with their flesh. Then when you read chapter 20, verse 9 through 15, we have these words. Chapter 20, verse 9 through 15. And they marched up over the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. But fire came down from heaven and consumed them. And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and saw for where the beast and the false prophet were, the whole unholy triumvirate, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Most people want to see that take place. But that's not all that's going to take place. And from verse 30 down through verse 15, 15, and if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he too, that's the point, was thrown into the lake of fire, the same lake where the unholy triumvirate is thrown in. And here's the reason why endless suffering, chapter 22, verse 10 through 14. Verse 10 says, And he said to me, Do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. Let the evildoer still do evil, and the filthy still be filthy, and the righteous still do right, and the holy still be holy. Behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense, my judgment with me, to repay everyone for what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. I have a quote for you from Don Carson in The Gagging of God. I'll put it back on the table after this, and we're almost done. And it's found in the chapter called On Banishing the Lake of Fire. What is happening across uh, evangelicalism? uh, Christians and evangelical churches are now denying the very existence of the lake of fire. And Don Carson says this, page 533. If the holy and those who do right continue to be holy and to do right, 
in anticipation of the perfect holiness and rightness to be lived and practiced throughout all eternity, should we not also conclude that the vile continue in their vileness in anticipation of the vileness that they will live and practice throughout all eternity? And the reason why these sections are teaching uh, these truths is because so that we can answer the question, why is it forever? And the answer is simply this, because they never stop sinning. They do not weep over their love of Babylon, but weep that Babylon did not provide them the joys that Babylon promised. And so Jesus is the lamb standing. He's the lamb that is redeeming. He is the lamb that is bringing his wrath. Therefore, what we've seen from last Sunday, answer the call to endure to the end by this. And I end with this. By keeping the commandments of God. Back in chapter 14, there it is. Here's a call for the endurance of the saints. Verse 12. Those who keep the commandments. So keep doing that. It's a call. Keep the commandments of God. What does that mean? It really means in John's language as in his epistles, whatever God's word says, go down with it. Whatever the world is doing, whatever pushback you're getting, stay with the word. Stay with the word. Know the word. Breathe the word. Apply the word. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and your neighbor. And then keeping your faith in Jesus, who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. Meaning, don't put your faith in government or money or your ideal church family or your health or your money or a perfect family or the perfect IRA or mutual fund or whatever or 401k or the American dream or the endearing friendships on Facebook. Not or the circumstances of life that please your personal preferences every day. Don't put your faith in that. Rest your head on Christ and take a nap. And then get up and get back to work and keeping the commandments. And then in chapter 14, verse 13, this is how we end. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, write this, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Those seven churches, oh, what? I, I think that was a, just a model. He started putting all over the houses. So if we go down, if we get martyred, the Spirit says, blessed indeed, that they may rest from their labors, for their deeds follow them. So What? Hear this, call, keep the commandments, keep your faith in Jesus, and, anticip and also anticipate the time of rest from your labors in Emmanuel's land. One day, and I was able to share this day, Boehm, with another guy this week, said the same thing, and he took it a little bit better than you did, but it worked. I met with a man who is in his 60s right outside of Wayside Cross Ministries this past Thursday morning. Ivan, Ivan, I just got to talk to you and talk to you. He told me, told me, told me about the hard, hard life of sanctification that he's enduring, enduring, hard things. Oh, hard, hard things. I just wept for him. And one of the things, among others, that I shared with him, how old are you? He told me. I said, give or take a year. Do you realize you only got 20 maybe at best 25 more years of enduring and then you get to rest forever. I'm going down with that. That's enough for me. And it ought to be enough for you to stick it out and live your life for the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, now help us to sing a great old song by Isaac Watts. He looked at 2 Timothy and saw the call upon elders that we are to run this race like a soldier. And soldiers who have been enlisted by their captain, Jesus Christ, their chief, do not get caught up in civilian affairs. And we are all soldiers of the cross. So Lord, help us to sing with joy and conviction. In your name we pray. Amen.